Hi ladies and gentlemen, this is Andrew Tan and today I got a very special guest with me. His name is Derek Gale. He's a world-renowned online entrepreneur and internet marketing expert and uh, my mentor as well. So that's why I wanted to put this interview together. Now, why am I doing this? Okay, see, it is now May 2020 and the world is in crisis because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Other than the risk of getting the virus, daily lives are actually being disrupted. There's fear in the air and at the same time, there's a creeping uncertainty that's growing in many people and that's the uncertainty of whether their one income stream is going to be around in the months to come. To me, see, I feel that there is a cancer in the society right now. Cancer is a cancer of one income stream. Many people are realizing now that to have just have one income stream by jobs or being self-employed, that is too risky already. And especially now when people are caught at home and they cannot go and do jobs or go about their livelihoods, some people are even wondering how long is their job going to be secure. We've got even uh, billionaires going bankrupt, you know. So that's why there is, there is this kind of uncertainty and fear. And my objective of this interview is to give you encouragement and direction if you are in need of a breakthrough, okay? And also to let you understand the power of online businesses and why it's more even important now that you get started. Let me tell you more about our guest today. Now, Derek Gale is one of the founding fathers of online marketing. Before Facebook, Instagram, social media, he has already built an internet empire. He co-created the largest internet education provider in the world called the Internet Marketing Center. And in 2008, he sold his business for an eight-figure sum. And today, he's a world-renowned international speaker and mentor. And he's also an entrepreneur now, enjoying the lifestyle of having a, a time with his family and yet still building eight-figure uh, businesses on his side. So that's why I wanted him to come and share with you what is the journey that he went through and how his journey can actually help you in your journey as well. Hi, Derek. Nice to meet you. Hey, Andrew. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Now, I got one question for you, okay? Yeah. So the one challenge we're all facing here in Canada is nobody can get their hair cut. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, like, literally, my wife cut my hair the other day. How yeah. come your hair is so nicely cut? Can you guys still get your hair cut in Singapore? I uh, know we're not getting since uh, about a week plus ago. We, we haven't been getting haircuts really. They, they closed down um, all all hairdressers. So now people are buying clippers. So now now like clippers market are going up and people are yeah. doing their own and then I'm doing my own shaving. You know? Oh, you're pretty good. You've got it nailed. I'm impressed. I'm my impressed. wife did it for me. My wife did it like this side and that side and the top is just like leave it, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's crazy times, really crazy times. Yeah, absolutely nuts. And uh, um, actually, I do feel quite a bit of pain for the people out there. Like, there's this thing that I coin called the cancer of one income stream. And I feel that society has kind of awakened that just a single job or a, a single self-employed income is not working. Everybody's staying home. And, and, mm -hmm. and the, even the people that's coming to my webinars, they are saying like, Okay, I've got this offline business. It's like a, a, a food, store, food stand or food store, but I'm stuck. There's nothing I can do. What can I do now? So that's why today I wanted to target um, not just... In the past, we used to target like newbies, right? Um, um, getting online. But now I think it's that opportunity at the same time as a crisis and uh, people need to get to notice uh, um, internet businesses. And because you, you are here, you've been around for the longest time uh, I, and you've got this experience and foresight to see since like the 1990s till now to the future, what could be the one thing that sustains long term? And, and I, I just say a bit more about the setup. It's like, I feel that, that many people need not just one stream, two streams, but side income that can go online that can sustain long term. What are your thoughts about that? Look, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people are waking up and realizing that um, oh, their their incomes are fragile. Yeah, and uh, you know I think it's a real wake up call for a lot of people that had jobs that they 
um, thought were never, ever going to kind of go away, right? You see these people that work for big companies or, or government workers, for example, or, yeah. you know, here, here in, uh, in Canada, like people that work for the municipalities, the government, stuff like that, they're getting laid off. We're seeing major companies, big companies laying people off. And I think what happens is people get jobs with these big companies or with, you know, government organizations, et cetera, et cetera. And they yeah. believe that, their their income is effectively invincible yeah. um, and for, you know in in for many years they were correct but we've just proven that one simple little invisible thing that's yeah. now impacted the entire world has proven how fragile so many people's incomes are and uh you know and i my heart goes out to so many of the people out there right now that are that are struggling um and uh, don't know where their next paycheck's coming from. And I mean, honestly, man, uh, I'm thankful, you know, that you, me, we live in countries as well that are relatively wealthy countries that are able to inject money to support the populations, yeah. to carry small businesses through. But I have a lot of clients in other countries that they don't have that wealth in the country. And, um, you know, perfect example, the Philippines. And I've, I've done a lot of events there. I've got a lot of students in the Philippines. Wonderful yeah. people, wonderful country. But when I watched, uh, I was watching, the, uh, uh, I was reading a news uh, article on CNN Philippines, and they were talking about how much money the uh, Philippine government was injecting into the economy. Okay. And I, I forget the exact amount, but it was literally in the, you know, like a hundred million, 200 million sing dollars, right? Like, yeah. like nothing compared to, what our countries are throwing in we're throwing in tens of billions hundreds of billions of dollars and uh, you know i'm grateful we have that but there's people all over the world that that don't have that luxury and it's it's a scary time for a lot of people and i think you're right a lot of people are waking up going holy crap i need to i need to diversify my income or or take control of it it's actually the same here in singapore I, uh, I do feel for the crowd and I've been not just the, the crowd uh, from that they are coming from my previews and my talks and all that, but friends, friends themselves, initially they thought this is going to go away in like two weeks or uh, maybe a month max. And then when we had the lockdown, they were having parties online, but the, par the party mood is over already. And now it's like, shit, looks like my income is going to be affected and, uh, uh, even big companies are laying off, even though the government is giving giving grants and all that, people are still laying off. And we recently even saw a news, billionaire went bankrupt. So it's like... Oh, know. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, their, their net worths are being erased. Um, you know, and so many billionaires, they're a billionaire on paper, but yeah. their their money is tied up in stocks, in... Um, in assets that are valued by the markets that have just plummeted now. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is, this is uh, like any major crisis, there's going to be a massive shift of wealth going through this, right? So, uh, you know, the, the question is, is how do people, how do people not only survive this, but in, in maybe even thrive through this? And that's the question that I, I think I've been really trying to answer for a lot of people. Yeah. And, and that's the, the question that uh, I hope this interview will be, be, be able to address as well. Now, see, the thing is that when, when I talk to people, the general sense is, yes, I'm willing. Yes, I see the opportunity, but I'm stuck. Like, I'm in that yeah. state, uh, and I don't know how to break through that state. And, and why do you think, um, uh, I mean, why, why, why is one question, but uh let, let's talk about that first why do you think people go into these kind of states look i i think um you know it's funny when people ask me hey you know what's the the most important thing if you want to be successful yeah. as an entrepreneur and yeah. without question my answer without any hesitation is mindset right yeah. um and the problem with most people who are kind of looking over the fence, they're on the employee side, right? And yeah. they're looking over the fence to that entrepreneurial side going, hey, yeah. I'd like to dip my toes in that water. But yeah. the problem is, is they've still been wired to be an employee. And, you know, you look at employees and people, and look, the fact is, is our education system, our society has raised people to be employees, full stop, right? We've been taught to go to school 
follow instruction, take tests, get an education, specialize in something, and then go sell our time for money. And so that's how everybody's been taught to do things. And so they're used to being given a daily, here's your task, here's your accountabilities, here's what you're responsible for. They're used to having somebody sort of put the, a path in front of them. And it's a major shift for people to step outside that and realize that, hey, I have to be accountable for this. And nobody's going to nobody's gonna force me to sit down at my computer um, and do the work and, and learn what I need to learn and to put in those extra times instead of turning on Netflix and, and it, you know, shutting that off and, and focusing on this. And then, honestly, you know what I think one of the biggest issues that exist with people that are looking over that fence mm -hmm. wanting to dip their toes but not is frankly it's just a fear of failure okay um and you said the word accountability there which i i feel this is kind of the the nail on the head okay the fear is there but then they they are not there to say that uh, uh i have this strong enough push yeah to, to say i won't go over not, not a strong enough accountability and in my opinion i think it would be awareness of the person to first realize how that dire that situation then they'll they'll take a push it's a pain pleasure thing now yeah um is it maybe let's go a bit psychology is it fear alone or is it that their emotional bodies are not being addressed do they need to go back and do some therapy and clear out stuff and then they say okay let's go yeah. Or, yeah, you know, I think everybody's on a different different level of of being able to overcome this. But I think we've got two issues at hand here, yeah. um, and and the first issue is a really a big one in places like Singapore or in Canada. And and I always go back to that saying, you know, the enemy of a great life, yeah, is a good life. Good life, true. And the problem we have in places like Singapore or Canada or, you know, we have great social systems, right? Yeah. We take care of our populations and, you know, you can, you can have a, a job and you can have a good life, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you're going to have food on the table. You're going to have a family. You're going to have a house. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Yeah. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But the fact is, is when people are comfortable and they look over that fence into the world of being an entrepreneur and they see potential failure, yeah. they see risk, they yeah. see hard work. And then they look back and go, Oh, well, actually, you know, I've got a good life. Um, whether it's conscious or subconscious, they fall okay. back into what's comfortable. And I think that's really uh, human nature, it is. you know, pushing yourself outside that comfort zone and as an entrepreneur um you know i wouldn't trade it for anything in the world it's given me an amazing life the ability to travel the world have more money than i ever thought was possible but at the end of the day you know what building what i've built i've had some really shitty days right i've had some highs and i've had lows and any entrepreneur that says to you oh no everything i did was a home run and i've never had a bad day they're lying Absolutely. Can you share with us a story like uh, you've been in business since I don't know when, when 1990s? Well, look, I, you know, I've been, I've been online since 1997. And honestly, I, you know, what led me to the internet was the fact that, um, you know, I didn't do well in school. Um, you know, I didn't do well in high school. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I always say, you know, I liked grade 12 so much, I did it twice. Right. And, and the, the fact is, is I, I did, I didn't graduate when I was supposed to. And, uh, and you know, I didn't find out until my twenties. It was because I have ADD. Um, and so I didn't do well in the academic world. And, uh, so for me, <laughs> the internet was a save was really, uh, saved me in the sense that, um, you know, I won't go into all the details. I could tell you, you know, for hours, the story of it, but, yeah. um, I was effectively unemployable, right? You know, I, I, you know, I, I wasn't that I wasn't a hard worker, but I didn't have any real skills at that point. I didn't have any education. I could only get kind of crappy labor jobs. I worked in restaurants. I worked on farms. I did labor, stuff like that. So for me, the internet was, uh, 
uh, was a real equalizer. And I still believe it is today because you can take somebody that has z almost zero education, um, mm. but as long as they got the willingness to learn, the drive, the desire, the internet allows people to start amazing businesses without having to um, have a, you know, a master's degree, to have a PhD, to have okay. major investment capital, et cetera. Um, now, your question was... Okay, right what, now... Right now, you see, the thing is, your story at this point would probably already trigger some feelings in the audience here. Especially right now, like what we were talking earlier, they are willing, but yeah. have a push. So in your, in your own journey, let's go a bit deeper. Like you, You've had your whole, whole stucks uh, and, and hiccups. And how did you overcome that? Can you share with us a story of how you... How you sure, you, honestly, man, it, it, for me... Okay, so I'm going to go back down here. After high school, I was struggling. Uh, I was working three jobs, and uh, I finally decided <clears throat> I need to make more money um, if I want to have any kind of decent life. And unfortunately, at that time, I thought if I wanted to make more money, I had to get a better education, right? So I finally made it through high school, and uh, I enrolled in a crappy little college to learn computer programming. And through this, I learned I'm a terrible computer programmer. But I discovered the internet. And uh, when I discovered the internet, it was actually through an assignment that I had been given in my class. And that was to go out in the early days of e-commerce, basically, and research how were people doing e-commerce online, right? How are they taking payment? And, and study, it was really an assignment to study the programming languages for like e-commerce back in the day. But yeah. for me, it was a real eye-opener because I got to see... Um, there was all these little websites with people that were selling stuff. And when I kind of looked under the covers, what I realized is these weren't, you know, big companies. These weren't uh, savvy business people. These were people that were just creating websites and starting to sell stuff. And that's when it kind of went, oh, wow, hey, this is interesting. And I started to pursue it. Um, and I spent a good six months. I was still working two jobs and uh, I would get home from work and I'd fire up my computer and I'd work till the wee hours in the morning and I was trying to learn how to set up websites and once I learned that I was trying to learn how to sell stuff and I, you know I joined some of the very first affiliate programs and then I started selling little ebooks back in the day and trying to trying to do that and in six months by the end of six months I was generating just over a thousand dollars a year online okay so in Canada, a thousand dollars a year goes nowhere. Or, uh, sorry, a thousand dollars a month goes nowhere. Yeah. So I was struggling, but for me, it's when I met my mentor, mm -hmm. and this was back. Now we're going back to 1998. Uh, I met a gentleman uh, by the name of Corey Rudel, and Corey, he was only four years older than me, but he'd already been doing business online. He was already making millions, and. Uh, I got to know Corey and it just turned out that he was also in Vancouver and, uh, and he mentored me. He started to, he kind of took me under his wing and started showing me, okay, here's, here's, here's how I did it. Right. And, and I think when people ask me, what's the fastest way to be successful? My answer is always find somebody that has already achieved the level of success that you want yeah. and learn how they did it and copy them. Not somebody who's going to teach you theory or, uh, you know, it's, but somebody that's actually done it. And uh, so it was, it was such an, an enlightening thing to happen to me at such a young age to realize that when you find somebody that's already achieved that, and they can go, hey, don't do that. It doesn't work. I already made that mistake. Instead, do this and do this, and it works. And then you go, all of a sudden, all these mistakes that you were making, they've, they've, they've skipped you over all of those. And uh, so that was it. Once I had that mentor, I went from struggling along to in just over a year, generating over my first million dollars online. And, you know, now the rest is history. I've built yeah. numerous six, seven and eight figure digital businesses since then. Yeah. And, and um, um, I want to pause there at this point. Like, did you did you pay Corey to become your mentor? Um, or was he like, just friends? You know, 
Mm -hmm. and, and again, I count my blessings because at that point, no, um, we were both two young guys in Vancouver and uh, yeah. I got, honestly, I met him back online in, in, a, in a chat group yeah. back in the days when we had chat groups and IRC chat and stuff like that yeah. on the old dial up modems. And it was just by fluke. He was there in Vancouver. And then as we started to build our businesses, we started to work together and then we built this company together called the Internet Marketing Center until, you know, he passed away in 2005. And, and uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. What I want to address is like some of our audience, especially those people who are still unsure, there, there is a doubt about mentors. There's, there's the doubt about, uh, is this guy trustworthy? Can, what, what he teaches, does it work? And uh, can I do it if, if I'm following this mentor? There's this general uh, distrust in, I, I won't say what this right, but you get what I mean. That there is something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how how does a person, uh, or what does it take for them to say, okay, I need a mentor. I want it. I go for it. Well, look. Uh, first of all, I think anybody who wants to be successful is going to be successful far faster with a mentor. Full stop. Yeah. But on the flip side, I also understand the distrust that exists out there in the world. And yeah. I think you would agree that there's a lot of people selling snake oil, right? Yeah. Selling get rich quick BS. And um, it's probably one of the things that frustrates me the most being uh, in this space is seeing how many, um, how many of the people that are running events and uh, doing courses and stuff like that yeah. don't actually yeah. practice what they preach. They're teaching stuff. Um, and the only way they're making any money is teaching stuff. They haven't actually done it themselves. Yeah. And yeah. you know, whenever I talk to an audience, I mean, the first thing I show them is here's my track record. Here's what I've done and make it really clear to people that, my primary income actually isn't events, isn't teaching this stuff. I do this because I love working with entrepreneurs. I truly believe that um, if I can teach somebody how to uh, build a business on the internet, how to use the internet to generate income, I can change lives that way. But at the same time, I also have numerous other businesses that are selling all sorts of products online. And when I teach somebody, I'm teaching somebody based on the stuff that I'm doing in these other businesses. Yeah. So I'm yeah. practicing what I preach. And I mean, I actually, just before we logged on here today, I went and looked at one of my dashboards for my business. And at 6.47 PM today, our sales today were 57,723 US dollars. Just one day. For today. That's today. Awesome. So, so when I'm teaching people, I'm like, guys, I, I practice what I preach. You know, my events may not be the flashiest. Um, I'm not a polished speaker. That's not what I do all the time. I spend the majority of my time practicing what I preach, building businesses. And a few times a year, I do events and I do webinars. Why? Because I love working with entrepreneurs and seeing the change it can create. But for all of those people that are um, distrustful, the, the piece of advice I would give to you is make sure that you're learning from somebody that is also a practitioner of what they're teaching. Yeah. And they have a track record, not just a single track record, not just a one hit wonder, but have been able to replicate that level of success over and over and over. Because the other thing I see, and it pisses me off to no end, is somebody comes along and they have, uh, uh, they, they hit one home run, one home run. And now they call themselves an expert. They haven't scaled a business. They haven't done any of that stuff. They just, you know, they built a website and it made them $6,000 a month. And now they're teaching a course on how to build websites to make $6,000 a month. Well, frankly, unless you can do that over and over and over in different spaces and in different niches, yeah. you're not credible enough to teach it. I mean, you, Andrew, you've done e-commerce. You've done it in numerous different categories and numerous different products with numerous different brands. I trust that. You understand it. You know it. I don't trust somebody who said to me, hey, uh, I, uh, I sourced uh, you know, iPhone cases and I sold a thousand on Lazada. So now I'm going to go do events and teach people how to do it. I'm sorry. That's a one hit wonder. Until you can replicate it over and over, forget it. So for people who don't have trust, 
I will flat out tell you the fastest way to be successful is to get a mentor, but you got to find the right mentor. Yeah. And I want to add on to that. It's like, now we are talking about finding a mentor that's important. At the same time, finding somebody who's got repeated evidence of their, their, their success. But yeah. one more thing I want to add on. Sometimes people are good at doing what they do, but they can't teach or they, they don't have the heart to go and yes. say for you. Yeah. And True. that X factor, I would say every audience here, if you see the person, you will feel it. And if you are, you are, you are mentor shopping or, or whatsoever, I think that little X factor you need to really see if that person is sincere enough to take care of you. Has he got infrastructure to take care of you? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. That's critical is, is if you're going to find a mentor, you want to find somebody that not only has done it, but somebody that can actually communicate effectively what they've done in a way that you can duplicate, that you can replicate um, uh, so that you can experience that same success and also find somebody that's not holding stuff back, right? You know, uh, the good stuff. And I'll tell you right now, here's the biggest issue I have with people is you got to be willing to pay for that. Yeah. And you know, the fact is, is you're not going to go onto the internet and for a $37 ebook, get the complete A to Z on how to build a successful e-commerce business, right? Like that's just not going to happen. Good mentors cost money. Yeah. I mean, that's true. And, and I want to address that mindset as well, because people who pay, pay attention, but people who yeah. pay a lot, those are the ones who get the attention, the focus attention on the mentor. And the mentor, yep. I mean, we are humans. As much as we want to give back, we want to make sure that that, ex that energy exchange is fair. And I yep. think people need to realize that if you, if you want a $37 mentor, yeah, he might be able to teach you to make a few hundred bucks, but that's, that's about it. If you really want the long haul, something building sustainable long term, you need to work together with your mentor. And, yep. and, and with that, I just want to fast forward a little bit. Like um, you, you've created the Internet Marketing Center and you sold the Internet Marketing Center for eight figures. And in, in, the, in the interim, Corey passed away and you yep. had to take on that whole thing. So I think the, the, the question that we can learn a lot from here is first, first question. You were, you were there, the business was taking off, not that great yet, but yet you had to go through some hurdles. And these yeah. milestones are the critical ones that took it to eight figures. Can you share with us like, what were those critical milestones that took you to eight figures and the struggles in between and how you overcame them? Sorry, the struggle to rebuild, you said? The, the struggles in between. Oh, the struggles in between. Look, yeah. you know, it's interesting. As you... Um, grow and scale businesses, uh, you'll learn that at different levels, the same issues always pop up okay. to the point that, you know, there's, there's books that have been written. Okay. When you get, and they can almost pinpoint it at revenue of when you get to this level, here's your challenges. When you get to this level, here's your challenges. And, you know, going from six figures, actually, you know what, going from, let's say high six figures into the seven figures, low seven figures, that's not that hard. But it's when you go from seven up to the eights and beyond that things get different. And this is where I'm going to say a large majority of entrepreneurs hit a ceiling with self-defeating behaviors that prevent growth. And the problem with entrepreneurs, uh, and, and I'm speaking for myself, is we love to be in the trenches, right? Yeah. We're, we're hands-on. We're creators. We we get into the you know the details and and you know because we built this thing, right? And to be an entrepreneur starting something up, you got to be prepared to roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty. But that same mentality of being hands-on. And having you know your hands into everything, at some point between sort of the seven to eight figures becomes a hindrance, because you immediately all of a sudden become a bottleneck that does not allow growth. Because I don't care how smart you are, how hard you work, how many hours in the day you work, you physically cannot continue 
to be involved in every element of a business if you truly want to scale it. And so that's why a lot of people actually, what does happen is once businesses get to a certain level, you'll in many cases see the founder step to the side and they bring in a CEO, right? right. And, and that's very common because the founders and the entrepreneurs aren't always the ones that are wired properly to take it to that next level. And I, I can tell you, I mean, right now I've got a, a business that's doing eight figures and uh, I figure I'm probably good up to mid eight figures before I would really just want to step aside and bring somebody else in to run it. Because the trick from going to that seven to eight figures, first of all, first and foremost, is you have to be willing to let go of stuff. Okay. Which means you need to be able to bring in really high quality people, high quality people that you trust. And you are hiring those people for their skills. And with those skills, you have to trust them to be able to do what you are going to do or even to do it better. Right. Okay. And, and, and that's to get to from seven to eight figures. That is absolutely key. Um, the other thing that you need to do is all of a sudden systems processes become so much more critical in order to scale up. But, you know, I mean, full on, if you said to me, I want to go from seven to eight figures, what's the most important thing? Look, if your market's there and you, you know, you, you, if your supply chain can stay scale and your market's big enough, it yeah. really comes down to people and process a hundred percent. Oh, thank you for that. Because I, I, when you said that, it kind of hit something in me. Um, when, when when I did my diaper business, I mean, I, I uh, even till today, we we have just shifted and adjusted to trusting other people to do things for us. Because I yeah. realized I was the bottleneck. Um, people kept coming to me for um, um, decisions, like for production. What should we do with production and all that? And I had this mindset that I used to do this. I have got the most knowledge on this, and I was unwilling to let go until my my partner, he said to me, you need to let this go to our general manager. And if you pass it down to him, he'll be able to take it off your hands. You can go and do other things and yet the business can still run. Yeah. So that became a big change in my mindset to say release of control and trust of my, my team to take care of, of it. Um, but that, that here comes another, another question, which is like, it's like if let's say a team, let's say not talk about seven to eight figures, let's talk to even like five figures to six figures, okay? okay. There, there needs to be a point where um, we, we get funding. We, the, the company is, is uh, growing. The cash flow is kind of tight because we've got to put the cash flow into marketing, expansion, production. Or, so what, what can a business or person do if they need funding to, 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 to raise? Well, look, you know, that's an interesting one. I, I'll be honest, every business I've grown, I've bootstrapped. Okay. And uh, I'm, I like that. Uh, okay. Personally, okay. I prefer that. But the fact is, is there's certain businesses that are hard to do that with as well, right? right. Um, so I prefer... I prefer that just for myself because I don't want have to have to deal with investors. I don't want to have to deal with boards. I don't have to deal all with that stuff, right? right. Um, so typically, I look for ways to bootstrap and grow at a cash flow. And the way I do business and the way I teach my students to do business yeah. isn't a traditional branding play per se, right? Where we go out, we create a, uh, a product, and then we go and we buy ads and you know try and sell through traditional retail retail channels. Yeah. What I teach and what I do is I'm very much a direct response marketer, right? Okay. And in direct response marketing, if I'm investing in advertising, I'm trying to make a measurable, reliable, predictable return in the shortest time possible. And okay. then once I have that customer, I'm going to put them through a uh, process or a funnel, if you want to call it that, that maximizes that value out of it. And then okay. what I'm doing is as I'm growing that and I'm taking I'm trying to be profitable as fast as I can and then reinvesting profit to then sustain the growth. Um, how, do you get, how do you get the, the culture of this to be set in, into your entire team? And what, 
what did you do? Is it accounting calculation um, that made you say that you bootstrap things? You know, every business I run is run by numbers and metrics and dashboards. You know, as I said, um, before I got on this meeting, I went in, I can press a button. And I can see exactly where I'm at to that exact moment for sales for the day. Gross sales, I can split it out across my different channels. Then I can I see it compared against the same day last year to see, are we up? Are we down? Right? So uh, when you instill a culture of numbers, KPIs, which we call them key performance indicators, yeah. and you build a dashboard and making sure everybody in the organization understands how their job impacts the KPI and what they're, how they're responsible for that KPI, yeah. you then yeah. start to generate a culture that focuses around, you know, their number and their, their metric and their performance. I see. So that, that actually becomes the key um, component that, that makes the business bootstrap and sustain for the long term. And, and where am I coming from is because being entrepreneurs, we sometimes go for the new idea, the shining sure. object. Yep. And it is tempting to dump money into it to say, try it. But then yep. again, the staff member that takes on this role gets into that moment of excitement, but we forget that at the end of the day, we need to track back with our numbers. Is this working compared yep. to the last month? How was this? And and thanks for that. So so what you're saying is, is, is it's not just um, checking yourself as an entrepreneur, but it's about monitoring your, your numbers to ensure that you're, you're always steadily growing. Any other thing besides numbers and checking yourself that's really crucial to, to um, um, breaking through? Well, look, I, I think so. What, one thing a lot of businesses have learned over the last few months is, you know, yeah. cash is king, right? Yeah. Cash flow is king. So yeah. important, right? You know, to be able to weather storms. Because what I can tell you from now being an entrepreneur for 20 some odd years is, there's ups and downs. There's great markets and there's crappy markets. There's going to be, uh, this isn't the last business crisis we're going to face, right? Um, and, uh, you know, people have short memories. And, uh, you know, when the times are good, they forget about when the times were bad. And so, you know, as your business is growing, you always got to be, you know, shooting for best case scenario, but you always got to keep that worst case scenario in your back, you know, in your mind, right? And um, what if something does change? What if a market changes? In the internet world, we've seen Google makes a change. Amazon completely changes something, right? Rules yeah. are changing so quickly. So you need to make sure that you're prepared for changes because if there's one thing that's certain in business and especially on the internet is things will change, things will evolve. COVID pandemic or not, things are going to change and evolve. You've been around for a long time. You've seen it. You've seen it change eBay where you started, right? Is it anything today like it was when you started? Not at all. No, right? And, and so you need to be you need to be prepared for that change. Now, one of the interesting questions I get when I talk about change is people are like, well, why would I want to do business there if things are going to change? And the fact of the matter is, is this is the world we live in now. Yeah. Things are accelerating faster. But if there's one thing I want people to realize is there's two ways you can look at change. A, change sucks. People don't like change, right? Yeah. And most people get frustrated when things change. Or you can pivot your mindset and say, okay, change creates opportunity. So yeah. when we are faced with change, rather than bitch and moan about it, how about we stop and go, okay, if there's change, there's opportunity. If yeah. we go back through every major crisis, world wars, recessions, uh, pandemics that have existed, some of the biggest companies in the world were started during those periods. Yeah. And whenever there is a big global change, it creates opportunity. And, you know, I think one of the opportunities that's coming out of what has happened with the COVID pandemic is yeah. it has literally taken and fast forwarded what I thought was going to take five to 10 years in terms of e-commerce's evolution, as yeah. far as yeah. how businesses uh, allow their employees to work remotely, all of that stuff, the, you know, the adoption of, uh, of buying everything online, five to 10 years has yeah. now happened in months. 
and and let's we, we talked about it earlier but uh, we didn't record that Let, let's talk about it so what what is the changes that's happening we got facebook ads uh, costs are going well, down uh, people are buying more online what else well look i you know i think stepping back a big picture of of where the opportunity exists for the small guys entrepreneurs is all at once we had everybody just about in the bloody world was told to go home and not see anybody right yeah. social distance stay with your family yeah well how do we communicate the internet right everybody logged on and uh internet usage globally up 70 percent and you got to think about how much time we were spending online anyway right 70 percent shot through the roof and then what has happened is there's major groups of people that weren't buying everything online or buying anything online who are now going, hey, wait a sec, a perfect example, the baby boomer generation, my parents, mm -hmm. and a perfect example, I talked to my dad a few weeks, uh, probably early March, when this was all starting to sort of go sideways, and he called me and uh, he said, I need a webcam, because he teaches at a local university, and he says, I gotta teach my class online. And I said, oh, here's the webcam to get, Dad. He said, oh, okay, I'm gonna go down to Best Buy, our local uh, electronics store. He says, I'm gonna go get one. I'm like, Dad, why would you do that? You're not supposed to go out right now. Why don't you just go to bestbuy.com, order it, and it'll be delivered tomorrow? Yeah. And, you know, he kind of went, huh, yeah, you're right. And he went and he ordered it online. And so what's happening is we're changing habits. Our generation, we were already buying online, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, that said, there's more stuff that we're buying online that we might have gone to the market for before, the mall, whatever, that we're now buying online. Yeah. But this massive generation, let's call it 50 plus, 60 plus, yeah. they've now, and they've got a lot of money, they're now buying tons of stuff online. So, okay, so we have this massive growth in e-commerce through the roof. Like Amazon is overwhelmed, they're so busy. And they have infrastructure coming out, they're yin -yang and they can't even keep up. So it's growing like crazy, but at the same time as this happened, we had major industries like travel, like events, like uh, the, the, all these huge industries that yeah. spend billions of dollars on ads dried up overnight. They quit spending money on ads. Yeah. And so in the world of online advertising, as you know, most of the advertising platforms now are auction based, meaning the more advertisers there are, the higher the ad cost is. Yeah. So what happens when all of those advertisers jump off the platform, boom, advertising plummet and when advertising costs plummet we now have a perfect storm of it's cheap to get leads like i'm getting leads to webinars i know lots of people that are filling webinars off of facebook that are driving leads off of facebook for half of what they were three months ago and i'll be honest i never thought i'd see the day when when click costs got this cheap again it's like i never thought i'd see uh, you know, gasoline, fuel costs so yeah. cheap again. And, and oh my, they are. And so we have this window of opportunity that's open for people who want to pursue the online business thing. First of all, you're sitting from at home, probably many people with nothing to do anyway. You're online anyway. Why don't you figure out this internet business thing when everybody's online? There's opportunities galore. People are buying everything online right now. And, uh, the cost to actually build an audience is a fraction of what it's going to be in a year from now. Right. So, you know, for us who's been in this game for a while, we're like, Holy cow, this is almost a little bit of a gold rush. Um, and, and, but the window will close. Yeah. And even, even like if you talk about being an expert nowadays, I see more and more people are coming out to have their own brand, personal brand. Right mm -hmm. now you don't even have to pay for venue costs because you got zoom, and, and yep. this cuts your cost. And, and the truth is, the cost of advertising is going down. The cost of running the business also goes down. So at the same time, if you are going through this internet business, that, that's where I see the opportunity where your, your profits can be higher. Um, at the same time, there, there's another group of people that I like to talk about. Those people who are service industries. And if they, they, are, they are affected right now. So how yep. can a service industry guy now now start their business uh, uh, online and set up for the future? Look, 
it really depends on the service yeah. that they're providing, right? Yeah. But, um, you know, I'm seeing just about, if I look through my local community, every local business all of a sudden is like, hey, wait a sec. How can I bring my service to their home? A perfect example. In fact, just before I jumped on this webinar, speaking of my father, I was just on uh, the phone with my dad and I was chatting with him and uh, he was telling me about um, my, uh, my uh, well, his sister-in-law. Okay. So they own a luxury uh, lingerie store. Okay. So fancy bras, panties, stuff like that. Yeah. And it's very high class, very upscale. Um, and they refused to ever have a website. They said, no, nope, we won't have a web business. We don't need an internet business because the people who are spending, you know, $500 on a bra, they want, you know, to come in, to be fitted, to have all this personal touch. And, you know, I've seen businesses that have kept that old school mentality. And the fact is, is again, this accelerated the inevitable for them. Okay. And it forced them to f take a long, hard look and go, yeah, how do we, how do we do this with the internet? How do we provide that service? How do we do this? And now their website in just a couple months is up and running. They're making money. They're, you know, all these people that were their local businesses, they're not coming to their store, but they're ordering and it's being delivered. I think every service business out there needs to ask the question of how do we adapt a per another perfect example. Um, so uh, just before this all started, well, I shouldn't just be, sorry, when it was starting in early February, I bought a new car. Okay. So I bought a Land Rover and uh, when I bought the, uh, so I bought the Land Rover and uh, about a month after I bought the Land Rover. So now we're yeah late March when everything was kind of going really crazy here. And uh, the salesman I dealt with, wonderful salesman. And uh, I had to have some uh, stuff added to the car, uh, to the car. So he came and got it and he brought it back one day and I was talking to him and uh, he delivered it to me because I didn't want to go down there because, you know, COVID. And yeah. I said, so how are sales going? Um, you know, are people coming into the dealership? And he said, no, but he said, I had a call the other day. Um, and, uh, a guy had some questions about, uh, one of the Range Rovers. And I said to him, I said, Hey, you know, I understand you don't want to come down, but what if I brought it to your house and, uh, I took you for a test drive and you didn't even have to leave your, you know, you didn't, you don't have to come downtown. Mm. And the guy said, sure. So they hopped in the car and, you know, he went to this guy's house, took him out for a drive and he got to test drive the car and, and, uh, you know, they talked about the price and the guy said, I'll take it. So then he called the finance guy at the dealership who came over to the guy's house with all the paperwork and he signed it. Now, <clears throat> let me ask you, what's a better way to buy a car? to have to go down, find the car, do the whole dealership thing, or go online, find the car that you want, call up the dealership, have them bring it to your house, drive it around your neighborhood where you know the streets, where you're comfortable, have it all done, all the paperwork delivered to you. Well, when I see the shift that's happening, people aren't going to want to go back to the old way to do this. Right? Yeah. So even service businesses, uh, and uh, you know, whether it's an you know, oil change for your car, whether it's your taxes, whether it's all being forced to change. And those who are going to resist and those who think that at the end of all this, they're going to just turn their business back on the way it was and everybody's going to flock to it. Mm -hmm. They're wrong. Not we have retrained people on what their expectation is out of our businesses. See That, that story there already hits uh, some industries that, um, especially, hey, seriously, like right now, I would love to have my hairdresser come to my house and do my hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. And, and what you touched on is really important, which is if you are, if the audience, if you are in now a business where traditionally people come to you, now if you go to them and you make it available for, uh, you send out the message to your target clients that I will come to you, I think in the new economy, that's where the business is gonna change. Yeah. Now let's go back to another thing. Like, like go back to your uh, the example of the lingerie store. So in, in a short period of time, they used to have the old mindset and now they are forced to go online. 
Now, what happened in between? Uh, can you give us like the, the breakdown of the, the steps of what they did in order to get the business online? Well, uh, you know, I mean, it's funny because it's, it's not rocket science. I mean, it's basically something that you and I could do in our sleep now, right? Um, you know, for existing businesses that have existing customers, it's yeah. literally just getting a store up online and, you know, whether you're using WordPress, a website, Shopify, whatever, you already have inventory. You already have pictures, probably your product, getting them online and, getting in front of those people and saying, Hey, here's just, here's an easier way to get our products, right? Like it is serious. There's no rocket science. And that's, yeah. that's where I'm, I'm just scratching my head, looking at local businesses who have shuttered and they're not even looking for an alternative. And yeah. if I look at my local community here, I've got the people that restaurants, you yeah. know, half of them adapted. We'll do delivery. We'll do takeout. We'll do all these things. We'll bring the food to you. Yeah. But there's other half that just close their doors. And I go, why would they just close their doors? Why aren't they adapting? Yeah, and that was the kind of awareness that I wanted to address here. Because many people will say, oh, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. But actually, it's not rocket science. All you need to do is just go and get your existing customers. Let them know that you'll come to them. Let them know that you deliver to them. And then maybe put a little bit of Facebook ads within your community to say that uh, I, I'm shut down now in the store, but I'll still continue the service for you. And that shift, that simple shift is probably what people need to say. Oh, first, be aware, I need the shift. Second, be aware, if the old way is not coming back. And third, to be aware that if I'm the leader in that new way, there'll be all these laggards who are not doing anything and I'll be ahead of the curve when, when, the, when the lockdown lifts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A hundred percent. And look, the fact is, is if you're not making those shifts, you're not making those moves, your competitors are. Yeah. And when this is all over, which when we say when it's all over, it's, it's not going to be all over. I mean, until we have a vaccine, we yeah. are going to be in a state of uh, what they're calling here, you know, the dance and the hammer, you know, we dance out a little bit, see how it goes. And then we get hammered back, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's the way it's going to progress until we have a vaccine. And I know there's people out there saying, oh, we're months away from the vaccine by the end of the year. <clears throat> I challenge that. We have never, the fastest vaccine we've ever come up with was five years. And that was for the uh, mumps or the measles back yeah. in the 1950s. You know, yes, technology is a lot faster now. But every expert that I've listened to said, You're, before we get something that we know is safe is at least 18 months, right? So we've got a long ways to go. And we're just at the beginning. So people are going to be retrained. Their expectations of businesses are being reset. You need to meet those expectations if you want to come out the other end of this thriving. Awesome. Now, let's come back to the person who's hearing this. And he's saying, okay, I know it, Derek, I'm still at home, I'm an employee. So yeah. let's say for the person who's in a hurry to get started and have that limited startup budget, can you point like what's an easy way to get started and how they should set up the business development plan? Well, look, and, and this is always a tricky one. Um, but when I take somebody from scratch that yeah. is just getting started, my personal advice isn't to go out there and source physical goods and bring them to a warehouse and, and do all that expensive stuff, right? If you're looking for a way to tip your, you know, just dabble your toes in the water and build some experience and make some money and learn, um, the fastest and easiest way to get started is to find a niche, full stop, right? Pick a niche, something you're interested in, uh, something a market somewhere, something very focused, a specific group of people that have some specific need, want, problem, or interest, right? Wow. And then the very first thing you're going to do isn't going to be sell them stuff. Rather, it's going to be build a list, okay? So lots of ways you can build a list. But when I say list, let's get them on an email list. And then let's start communicating with them and start sharing information. Now, if you've ever been to one of my events, you will know that I'm an absolute uh, massive fan of information marketing. Um, and the reason why is when you use information, 
information is a powerful thing because by sharing information with somebody, you can create a very powerful relationship, a relationship which I like to call that trusted advisor. Like for you, for you Andrew, you are a trusted advisor for so many people in Singapore, Malaysia for e-com, you know, how, how to start an e-com business, how to import from China, how to sell on uh, the different platforms, Lazada, Shopee, stuff like that. You are that trusted advisor. Once you've established yourself as that trusted advisor, that relationship is very powerful because when some, look, people want to do business with people they know, like, and trust, right? Mm -hmm. And when you can create a relationship with somebody by sharing information and educating them, helping them and building that status of trusted advisor, you can now leverage that relationship to create a business, to sell products, to recommend products. And when you have that database, that email list, look, I, you know it, I know it, but most people don't realize it. Most people think, oh, if I'm going to start a business, I, I got to create products, I got to sell products. But we know our most valuable assets, not our products, but it's the database of people that we have that are listening to us that we can communicate with. And once you have that, there's all sorts of things I can teach you to sell, whether it's digital, whether it's affiliate stuff, so you don't even have to have the products, whether it's you know, drop shipping or, or e-com or whatever. Mm. But that is by far the easiest way to get started. Anybody with the right teaching, with the right mentoring can find a niche, can set up a, a, a simple opt-in page, start driving traffic to that, start building an email list, start communicating with it, and start monetizing it, generating income from that list with very little investment and in a very quick time frame. Awesome, and I want to add on to that. You see, many people, even in my e comm space, think of product first. Yeah. Uh, product. But to, even when I do products, I don't think of the product as a product, but I always think of the audience or the customers, their needs, their wants, their pain first. Then I, I build a following on that, on that niche or the, that pain. And then the product which I already have in mind is just there to cater to, to all these pains and wants. You see, that there's something that, that I, I learned, which is, the world actually does not need more products. We've got enough products. But what yes. the world needs is better solutions to existing problems. And we can, we can form that following, address their needs and pains, and then we give them a better solution to their problem. I think that's where the money is going to be. Don't care whether is it uh, information products or is it uh, physical products. It's the same. Yeah. 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 And I'll go one step a bit deeper, like now, okay, so if let's say a person goes through this stage and they identify they've got their list, they've got the idea of the products that they want to sell. In businesses, I notice there's a problem that happens. There is the paid advertising road that gets our, our demand up, our, our followers up very quickly. But yeah. let's say it's not COVID situation, normal, normal situation. The, the auction of the ads would get more and more expensive. And then it becomes churn and burn. So, uh, um, and, and sometimes when it gets too expensive, the business, uh, uh, when the profits get too thin, the whole model crashes and the business does not work. And yeah. in my opinion, the solution would be um, um, non-paid advertising. That means the community relationships, content marketing that you, you do it on the site while you do your, your Facebook ads. That, that thing should come in. But that part, I'd like to consult you a little bit more on what can a person do if, let's, let's say, they, they, they know that if they spend Facebook ads, it's going to be too expensive one day. What can they do to ensure that before that happens, they sustain continuity in their business? Look, you know, here's the thing with ads yeah. is ad costs will, they're going to continue to go up. Right. Yeah. But even though they've gotten to a certain price, people are still making money. Yeah. So you've got to ask yourself, okay, if I'm not making money, but at this ad price, but the next guy is, what is he or she doing that I'm not so that they can afford to spend those money on those ads. Right. So you know, that's always the first question I ask myself because I'm a big proponent of the fastest way to scale is you've got to spend some money on ads, right? Yeah. But back to your question is, you know, what do you do? It really comes down to building a list, right? You know, 
again, one of the big mistakes I see people make is they spend a ton of money purely on ads, particularly on Facebook, and they'll be driving to a product, right? But they're not building a list. And so if somebody buys, great. If they don't, they're gone. When in reality is if you could have got all those people onto a list, now we have the luxury of time to be able to market to those people without having to continually spend money to get in front of those, right? Um, now, the other side of it, though, and, you know, I've always been a big proponent of this is diversification in your traffic sources, right? So never relying entirely on one source of traffic, because as you know, if you do, if you rely on a single platform for traffic, things change, right? And if something changes and that's your only source of traffic, you know, you can be out of business very, very quickly. So when I'm building a business, I will take and figure, okay, where's my number one source of traffic? Maybe that is Facebook and I start on Facebook, right? And I'll, you know, I'll do the paid side. I'll do everything I can organically, you know, on the free side of Facebook, but that's becoming less and less, right? I mean, the fact is, is Facebook has really become a pay to play platform. Um, but at the same time as well, I'm a huge fan of, for example, affiliate programs, right? So I've got a bunch of affiliate programs for different products where people uh, can promote those for me. I am a huge SEO nerd, right? Uh, search engine marketing, search engine optimization. I get thousands of unique clicks every day out of organic search. And, you know, it's one of those ones where I hear people say, oh, you can't rank in Google anymore. It's too hard. I'm like, no, it's not. It isn't it's sure it's harder than it was 15 years ago, but it's still absolutely possible. And one of the you know best sources of super high intent, high quality buying traffic, right? Um, you've got all these other platforms as well. The Amazon's led to that as the shoppies. If you can plug a product into those fantastic, right? So diversification is key. And you know, we've got the native ad networks. We've got, um, uh, you know, and the targeting even, uh, we've got pay-per-click, you know, pay-per-click is one of those ones that I watched everybody flock away from over to Facebook. Yeah. And well, at the same time, I'm still on AdWords. And if anything, AdWords has just gotten better and better and better. Um, so in fact, one of the things I've seen is people start coming back to AdWords now. So look, it's about diversification you know, never relying entirely on one thing for your entire business. Thank you for that. Because we haven't heard any buzzwords that's SEO in like a few years. Really. People just keep talking about Facebook and Facebook and Facebook. Yeah. yeah. People that are doing SEO are still getting generic traffic coming in. Oh, ridiculous amounts. And I mean, you got to think every single day on that little box on Google, there's over 3 billion words typed in. 3 billion. Like, that's enormous. Okay. And there is tons of opportunity that still exists. But you know what, you know what the problem with SEO is? Yeah. is people aren't patient. Uh. It takes time, right? It's a long-term investment. So whenever I start a new website or a business, I want to go after the fast stuff, right? So, you know, paid stuff, uh, whatever I can do to start getting stuff going. But I'm always taking a percentage of my profit and I'm investing in the long term in developing. I look at a website as a piece of real estate, right? And I, I'm investing in the long term value of that by optimization, link building, quality content, right? Not the black hat stuff, but the stuff that's going to give me long sustainable rankings over time. And it may not pay back for six months. It might not pay back for a year before I really start to gain stride with that. But when I do, that traffic is some of the highest converting traffic you're going to get and you're not paying for it. So that's the problem with SEO is people don't have the patience for it. Um, the people that do make a fortune with it. Uh, I can understand because it, nowadays business is all about ROI and and that's why what you say is important. At the same time, I want to ask you like out of your marketing budget, how many percent do you set aside for SEO? Yeah, I, you know, there's there's no fixed budget. It really depends. But you know, the, the irony of it is, is it's not necessarily all that much. Um, I mean, I can tell you, okay, if you ask me today on one of my 
primary commerce websites, you know, right now I, I'm spending sure $2,000 a month in uh, content development. I just signed a contract um, where we're uh, spending $5,000 a month for link building. Right. Yeah. And, and people go, Oh my God, I, I couldn't spend that. Well, you don't need to, right. I'm yeah. going up against big, uh, high, high traffic, high competition keywords. When you start out, you start out on the long tail stuff. You start out on the stuff that doesn't have that big competition and you build from there and you don't have to spend that kind of money on it. Right? So as far as what do I carve out for budget? There's no percentage okay. because it, it, it's, it depends on, on the web property. It depends on the niche. It depends on a lot of different elements. Okay. Thank you for that. Then let's talk a bit about the, the free traffic stuff. If let's say now you've got the, your list, your database is building. Uh, can you share with us some tips that you, you, how you keep your list engaged and loyal so that they would share and buy more? Can you share with us some tips on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, keeping your list engaged is just, the, here's how I look at a list and I communicate with a list. Yeah you need to look at your list as a group of people that you're having a continuing conversation with. Okay. And throughout that conversation, you're making recommendations for products, right? Yep. Uh, yep. For solutions, helping them, things that they're going to, uh, that you know they need and you're recommending, but it's, it's an ongoing conversation, not yep. a series of just, you know, hammer, 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 sell, 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 sell. Yep. But, you know, an authentic voice communicating with them on a consistent basis and occasionally making great product recommendations. I mean, you know, and sharing stuff that if it has value to you, share it with them, right? Hey, I just read this great article. I thought you might want to check it out, right? Like just that kind of stuff. I mean, that's, that's as far as engagement goes. Now, the, the other part of your question was, and I'm blank now, not, it was engagement and what was the other part? Uh, relationship building, community building. Yeah. So, I mean, community building, we live in a, God, in such an amazing time. I mean, I'm a huge fan of membership websites, right? So for all of my platforms and trainings I do, I do it all on membership websites. Yeah. Um, and I used to have forums in those to create community. But the fact is, is today mm -hmm. we have this really amazing thing called Facebook groups. Okay. that everybody's already on Facebook and look, I'll give your listeners a little, uh, a thing to keep an eye on. My prediction is the next big thing that Facebook is really going to start putting more money and emphasis into over the coming years is Facebook groups. They've been kind of the, you know, the neglected, uh, the neglected stepchild for, for quite a few years, right? Facebook obviously, first and foremost, newsfeed pages for businesses. But then we get to these groups and groups have been really neglected. But if you really look over the last year and a half, two years, they've started adding features and functionality to groups and they're beta testing a whole bunch of stuff. And sometime I'm hoping this year, but definitely by next year, they're going to start allowing people to, and they've already rolled this out in beta in a few places, the ability to boost posts from our groups. Yeah which is a whole big old game changer. So we have the ability to go to this platform where everybody is, create groups of people. They're already on the bloody Facebook every day, right? Yeah. And they've given us a great suite of tools to create a community in which we are the head figure, we are the moderator of, and we are the leader of. And those who are building their groups today on Facebook are getting a head start because as it becomes more mainstream and they start adding more features and more functionality to it and everybody's on it, people will start to pick and choose their groups. You know, it's, you know, once there's too many of them, it gets more competitive. So if you want to build a community, your list is how you have a conversation, but it's one way. Yeah. I guess one of the, when you're marketing online, it's funny, people ask me, I get this all the time. Why would you email? Isn't email dead? Why wouldn't you just use Facebook? And, uh, you know, my answer to that is, well, look, if Facebook ever needs to send you a important message, do they send it to you via messenger? No, 
no. they send it to you by email, right? Email is still the primary communication platform, but what people don't realize now is there's so much distraction out there. You want to be able to send a message to a single person through as many channels as possible to get the highest possible response. So if I can have somebody in a group, I can have somebody following my page that I can boost posts to. I can have somebody on an email list that I can email and I can have them following me on Instagram and Twitter at the same time too. Great. The more ways I can reach somebody, the better. And that's that whole sort of omnipresence that we're shooting for. Right. And I think that's key, right? It's no longer about just doing one thing. It's about doing a whole bunch of things to reach your audience. Okay. So now um, we have, we'll talk about the, the omnipresence. What's the difference if the omnipresence is branding yourself as a person, you are leader of the group versus if you're branding a brand, a product brand, what's the difference in play here? Look, I, there isn't, you know, I mean, when you have a person, yeah. you have a voice. When yeah. you create a brand, a brand has a voice, right? And you're going to communicate with that voice via email, via Facebook pages, via... Now, the one exception to that is I don't believe a Facebook group... I shouldn't say that. I was going to say, I was about to say Facebook groups don't lend themselves to be led by a brand as well. But I think in some cases they could, but for the most part, Facebook groups are about networking with people, right? So I think you could potentially have a group as under your overarching brand. So I just contradicted myself there. No, you could totally do a group for a brand as well. So there is no difference, right? A brand is a voice for a product. Yeah, and if we say, we, if, if a brand talks about the language revolving around the customer's needs, then that conversation continues. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, I was thinking about that as well. Now, um, our conversation has been like about an hour plus already, and there are certain things that, that I, want, or I still want to touch on, which is... Okay, let's um, do it. What, what do you... Let's talk about yourself. What do you do on a daily basis that really fuels your, your habits, that um, fuels your success? So, first, and this is, you know, people ask me, how do I get so much stuff done, right? I run numerous different businesses, yeah. um, but I still have a family, kids, I spend a lot of time with them. I love mountain biking. As you can see, I like music as well. Um, I have lots of hobbies and interests and stuff like that. And one of the things I think I learned early on was most people spend a better part of their day doing what I call busy work, right? Stuff that makes them feel busy, but isn't necessarily having a significant impact on their business. So every day, the first thing I do here, and if you look over, uh, over there, I've got my whiteboard. I sit down and I make a list, right? Okay, what are all the things that I have to get done today? And then I look at them and ask myself, do I have to do these myself or can I delegate them? Is there somebody better to do these? Uh, now, when you're first getting started, you don't have that luxury if it's just yourself, right? But then I asked myself, okay, what is the single most important thing that I have to get done today to move my business forward, to achieve my goals for the month, for the quarter, and for the year? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess to preface this is I have a very defined goal setting system for, you know, my year, my quarter, my month, and then even down to my week. Yeah. And I am religious about goal setting and mapping out what I have to get done. And uh, now once you have a team of people, the very first thing I do in the mornings is I meet with my key people, typically online. I work remotely most of the time and make sure that they know exactly where they're at, what they need to do. And that trickles down through the organization. But for me, that, that's, that's key. Right. And I see so many people that they, you know, they come in, they check their email and then, oh, I got to, 
put this fire out. Oh, I got to do this. Oh, I need to do that now. Look, there's always going to be those little things. But if you let those things suck up all the time in your life, you will never build anything meaningful. So that first and foremost is absolutely uh, key as far as one of my daily habits go. And then the other daily habit is constantly learning. Um, you have to be a lifelong student if you want to be successful in business on the internet. And I am constantly, it, it, honestly reading, you know, I've always, I'm always reading something, studying something, yeah. um, working on some kind of course, whether, and you know, sometimes I don't get anything out of it, but other times it could be one little idea, but it's a constant evolution. I challenge people. If you just even took 15 minutes a day, and started reading 15 minutes a day, 30 would be better. In a year from now, you're going to know so much more than you currently know today. Mm. Um, yeah. Have you, have you come across situations like um, you are conflicted inside because the old way actually works so well and you are learning a new way, a new way would probably make the old way redundant. How do you, um, how do you reconcile that? Well, you know, it's interesting because there's always the newest, best, kind of hottest way to do things. In yeah. fact, I'm reading a book right now called Atomic Habits, Habits, and it's the, you know, the next thing on, you know, how to set good habits and stuff like that. And, and there's always a new spin and a new take. But it's funny, the more business books I've read, when we get down to like sort of the fundamentals of doing business, mindset, stuff like that, most of them are just an evolution of what was already working or a spin, someone's spin on something already existing. I don't find in this day and age, people are coming out with anything that's completely new, completely revolutionary. So it's, it's more of an evolution. So what I simply do is ask myself is, does this fit into what I'm currently doing? Do I see value in it and pick and choose what I think is going to be most effective? But here's the big kicker is quit jumping from one thing to another thing. And this is where uh, so many people are sabotaging themselves because they're always chasing the next greatest thing. Oh, I've got this new app for, for time tracking. I've got this new, uh, this new system for setting goals. I've got this new, you know what? Here's the thing, goal setting, time tracking, productivity stuff. They all work in one way or another. Find one and stick to it. And when you do, you'll start to get results. Quit hopping from the next from one shiny object to the next shiny object. Yeah, I, I got a friend who's a shiny object of marketing ideas. This, this uh, say, Frank can say something and then, oh, I don't know, I'm going to try that thing. And yeah. some people say that. So, um, yeah, I hear you now that, that pick on something, it, it evolves, but the fundamental principles still stay the same. Yeah. And that brings me to my next question. Like, that, like you've been around... Um, um, in my opinion, you are one of the early forefathers of internet marketing. And you have a unique perspective compared to all those new age, uh, not new age, sorry, the new marketing gurus that came out only in recent years. That means, uh, uh, what I'm asking is, like, since then, 1996, 97, till now, till the future, you have got an insight of what has been always working and what would sort of sustain uh, what would be longevity business? So can you can you give us some uh, pointers for the person who is really seeking longevity in their business, especially in this space of uh, online marketing? Where do you see is the things that are the things that will never change, and what are the what's the future stuff that they should? Expect? Sure. Yeah, it's a really good question, and uh, you know what's I, I find fascinating is I watch you know these new guys come up and oh I've got this new revolutionary thing and I look at it and go it's not new and revolutionary. Uh, everything we do online is the principles haven't really changed at all. The platforms which we use to execute the marketing principles have absolutely evolved and those have changed. But the whole selling principle, the whole sales principle, the whole uh, structure of a sales process has not changed. Where we get the leads, sure, 
that's evolved, right? Um, you know, today it might be a Facebook ad and, you know, 10 years from now, it could be a virtual reality room. Who knows, right? But the fact is, is every single business is based on the foundation, the framework, the, you know, the blueprint of, okay, we need to find the right people, targeted people, people that are interested in our offer, right? We need to get our offer in front of them. We need to take them through a sales process that builds, you know, and if we really want to get down to the science of it, you know, grabs our attention, agitates the problem, presents the solution. Um, you know, literally it's, it's the, the fundamental most. sales process. And, you know, in the early days, the very first, when we first started selling online, we had those long sales letters. And in many cases, it was just text. There wasn't even an image in these things, right? And we didn't invent the long sales letter. We took those from old school direct response marketers back in the, who that started back in probably the 1930s, 1940s. And they worked out this process that we can literally break down of the, the sales formula. And over time, that has evolved uh, because technology's evolved. So it's not just a boring, you know, page with text on it. Now we have video, we have uh, imagery, we have, um, you know, different steps. But when you really break it down, if you showed me a successful product being sold online, we could reverse engineer how it's being sold and it's hit all of those key principles. And so here's what I challenge people to do is if you want to be successful over the long term, it's not about knowing the latest Facebook marketing trick today to get your ad to, you know, do this or Google's latest algorithm. It's having a foundational understanding of how to sell a product to a person, how to move them through a process using language to convince them to take out their credit card and invest in you. And once you understand the psychological journey that must take place in order for that to happen, as technology evolves, we're now able to look at the technology and go, okay, how do we best fit this process into this evolving technology? And that's what we continue to do. And that's what we'll continue to do in the future as we move to virtual reality and whatever the future holds for us. And so, you know, and it's funny when people ask me, well, Derek, you know, what, what's the most important skill I should learn? One of the fastest and best ways to learn how to sell to people online is to go and learn how to write sales copy. Yeah. To study ad copy, copywriting, even if you don't want to be a copywriter, when you understand how copywriting works, yeah. that will give you a solid foundation of those principles, which then are applied to whatever the latest and greatest technology platform is of the day. In fact, um, the copywriting is one of the first skills that I, I put in so much effort on. And now it just becomes second nature and yep. that influences the way I business build, that influences the way I write my listing. And the template really still sticks there. It's all about getting the attention, identifying the problem, telling them a solution, showing them, yeah. well, et cetera. And this yeah, it. yeah. it's the same thing. Exactly. And that, that's what I'm talking about. You're somebody who's done this over and over again, right? When I start talking about it, you can rattle off the framework, right? Here's the steps. Yeah. And once you understand those steps, all of a sudden, you'll actually recognize them as you start getting pulled into different sales funnels. You'll think, oh, look, they're removing the risk. Oh, there's the social proof. Oh, you know, all these different elements that move people through this. And so when people ask me, you know, like, oh, are you going to teach me, you know, the latest Google thing or the latest search this or email? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's all. That's, that's academic. In fact, we can outsource that stuff, right? You need to understand how to sell. And when you do, sky's the limit. Awesome. Now, next, next one. Okay. We, we humans, like yourself, you have many facades. You're, you've got your business persona, you've got your music, you've got your family. And yeah. actually, in the, in the future, I see that 
every individual will have many parts that they can brand and create a persona and monetize it. Yeah. What's your advice about um, building your own personal brand? Should you put everything on one website about yourself and then branch out to the different personas or different aspects of you and that you can monetize or you should separate them out? You know, that's a good question. I mean, look, I have uh, my own personal brand, yeah. but you know, I've got 40 other brands that you'd never know have anything to do with me. And those are physical goods, sort of traditional product stuff. Right. But, um, you know, I think, to ask the question of, okay, if I'm Derek, the e-commerce guy or Derek, the internet marketing guru, can I also be Derek, the guitar teacher and Derek, the piano teacher and Derek, the mountain bike instructor and be experts in all of those things? Yeah. Frankly, I believe that that's difficult to do for anybody because you're spreading yourself too thin. So you're, you know, you're, you're going to be mediocre at everything and not great at anything. Yeah. Um, so I'm never a big fan of that. Okay. Uh, that being said, I do believe that you need to be careful that um, if you're going to have two completely different niches, sure you can, um, but make sure that they don't conflict with one another, right? Okay. Um, but, you know, this, and it's funny because this probably every single event I do, webinar I do, somebody asks me that exact question. You know, for these different niches, should I you know, use different names or, or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, you could, but let's not get ahead of ourselves, right? Like, why don't we just focus on being just kick ass at one thing? Mm -hmm. uh, you know? Um, yeah. I'm a fan of that. Like Bruce Lee said, uh, he does not, Bruce Lee said, he does not fear the man who's got 10,000 different types of kicks, but he fears the man who practiced one kick 10,000 times. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's human nature. I think, you know, people are thinking way down the road, oh, I'm going to do all these different things. Don't worry about it. Let's just be good at one thing and do it really well. Yeah. And, and in my opinion, if you want to do a second thing, the second thing must be an evolution of your first thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for the call. And uh, we, we're going to end this soon. And the thing is that, um, do you have any advice now for, for, uh, two groups of people. Right now, as, as far as COVID-19 is concerned, the new economy is concerned. First, the person who's the newbie, who recognizes the need to go online already. And second is to the person who is uh, already doing something online, but they're kind of confused about the so many different aspects of marketing they should do. What, what advice do you have for these two groups of people? You know, I don't know if the vice for both groups is all that different, right? Um, you know, first, find, uh, it goes back to what we talked about earlier, right? Find somebody that's already achieved the success you want yeah. and learn from them. Um, okay. You know, if you're just getting started, uh, yeah. here's one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is they never take action because they never come up with what they believe to be the perfect idea. So believe is and, Sorry? So belief becomes the start that they can... Yeah, well, it's not even be belief so much as realize that as you're starting out, there's always going to be uncertainty. Yeah. There's no such thing as a business that you look at and go, oh my God, this is guaranteed to make me $10 million a year. There's always going to be uncertainty. Yeah. That's part of being an entrepreneur. Just pick something and start building and start learning. Because... Again, people sit around waiting for this magical, perfect idea to fall into their lap. Yeah. And one of the biggest challenges that I see is when you're first starting out, there's all these great opportunities around you. But right now, you don't have the skills, knowledge, or experience to be able to identify and recognize them. Yeah. But as you begin building something, even if it's in a niche that you have not a lot of interest in, yeah. Just pick something, start learning, building your website, building your list, doing even some affiliate marketing. Yeah. That process of building your skills and knowledge are going to all of a sudden take off these blinders so that you can look around and recognize the other opportunities that exist. And I can't tell you how often I have students that start 
in a niche over here in a business and they start building and growing. And through that process, they see an opportunity over here or an opportunity over there and they pivot and that opportunity takes off and grows. But had they never started this journey of learning and building and testing and trying, they would have never found that opportunity because they wouldn't have the skills, knowledge, experience to identify that. And for those of you that are out there, you've tried some stuff, you haven't gotten the results, you've bounced around from one thing to the other, again, find a mentor that has achieved the success, not once, but has done it over and over again, and learn from them. And be patient. Because... When I come across people, the people that I come across that say to me, oh, you know, I tried this and I tried that and I tried this and I tried that. Typically, those are people that are, you know, the $37 ebook buyers hoping for a miracle. Um, and they're not sticking with stuff long enough either. Um, as humans, we're impatient. We want results fast. We want results overnight. And the fact is, is take, starting a business takes time and it takes patience. And I'm not talking about five years before you're going to see a profit. But yeah, you could be building and working on a website for three months, four months, five months. But I can't tell you how often I've talked to entrepreneurs who've said, oh, I was just about to throw in the towel. I was just about to give up. And then boom, it hit and it started to grow. It takes time. So be patient stay focused yeah and uh that kind of ties into how we met and i i really want to take this opportunity to thank you for being my mentor um i was lost it was it was a, it was just when uh, i got cheated by the, that other guy whom you know okay and then and then aaron tracy came around i got to know you yeah i think what you're saying here really really um is a story that i want to share with everybody I'm not good at digital marketing. Although I started with digital marketing, I started trying to affiliate, I realized that I'm just not that guy. And then when, 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 I when I got introduced to digital marketing and I knew it wasn't good for me, then from there, um, we talked about eBay. And that was when I first got to know you and you became my eBay mentor. We started with insider secrets on eBay, started with eBooks, but from eBooks, then it became Terra Peak. And from Terra Peak, I started to, to understand about research of products, big data, and I just fell in love with selling thumb drives, SD cards, and, and then the, the, the thing just goes on. And, and first, I want to say thank you for that, because if I haven't got that simplistic view of saying, okay, now I, I choose eBay and physical products as my niche, and I stick on that, I won't be who am I today. And even till today, and I'm a physical products guy. I, I always continue. I, I know all these other stuff about digital marketing and all that, but yet I still take all those stuff and put it into physical products and building it. Yeah. And I, uh, my message to everybody is that, like what you said, you will get stuck because we humans face uncertainty. And you and I teach for so many years and we know that the problems or the objections that we face today are the same problems we get 10 years ago. And encouragement to everybody is just get started. Get started on something and, and adjust along the way. Yeah, I, I think that's my advice for everybody. Well, it's, and it's good advice, right? I mean, and that's years of experience speaking. Um, and, uh, you know, my biggest frustration is watching people who just, they expect just magic to happen overnight. And, yeah. and part of that's, you know, media is to blame because what does media publish? They publish those overnight success stories. You know, everybody sees the Mark Zuckerbergs or the, and you know, it's funny that, you know, everybody <laughs> sees these overnight success stories, but they don't, they don't re recognize the years of work that were required to have that overnight success. Yeah, true. And, and there's no such thing as, as uh, uh, um, they call it self-made millionaire. There's no such thing. Everybody, oh, God. Yeah. everybody had help at one point of time everybody yep. learn from from the shoulders of someone else 100 percent, 100 percent. don't don't have that mindset people shouldn't have that mindset that that they just need to do that one thing and then after that oh two months later boom yeah yep. agreed true 
Thank you so much for, for this call, Derek. And, and I really appreciate you for being on this call. And yep. uh, for, the, for, for everybody, Derek Gale um, has been in the industry since 1990s. He, he built one of the biggest uh, internet companies in the world, the Internet Marketing Center. Sold it off at, in two zero, 2008, right? And yep. 2008. And today, he, he's enjoying a lifestyle of very much balance family time, enjoyment of his life. And, uh, but yeah, but you know, I still love the business. I've still got multiple e-commerce businesses. Um, I don't know, you know, and that's what people say, you know, uh, when are you going to retire? And I, I, I don't think I ever will, right? I enjoy the, I enjoy business. I'm happy that we can still tap on your expertise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, I, I respect what you've done, Andrew, and uh, you're definitely one of the good guys. Um, so. Thank you. you know, in, in, in a place where there's a lot of snake oil and stuff like that, I'm glad there's guys like you out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. And um, let's end this call. And I hope uh, as an audience, you, you got some value. If you've got questions you want to ask me um, it, or, or Derek, you can literally look for us online. You can search for me, uh, Andrew Tan, Q10. Uh, you can look for Derek Gale. Our names are out there. You can, you can connect with us on Facebook. And we'll, we'll see how we can help you along your way. Thank you so much. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Spitting fire in Mike, got him out the dryer, he's hot. Found him in Fort Minor with top, but a fucking Nihilist porcupine. He's a prick, he's a cop, the tight women wanna be with him rapidly.